Is this simply a case of, uh, of burdensome union contracts has driven Hostess out of business, or has it also been a changing business climate? What's going on with Hostess? Well, I think this is kind of a perfect storm for them, unfortunately. It is a sad day for the 18,000 <coughs> workers who are going to lose their jobs. The fact is, uh, back th during the five-year reorganization from 2000 to 2009, the company tried to set a course that was going to get them on a proper financial footing. They got lots of private equity money. They got some other investment firms to jump in. And Dick Gephardt, actually, this is a name from the past, uh, Dick Gephardt in his uh, lobbying operation handled this uh, negotiation back in 2004 to 2009 with the Ripplewood Group that provided the first boost of money. Uh, Gephardt was very, very close to the Teamsters. The Teamsters agreed to concessions back then. It actually cost some te Teamsters some jobs, but they left in place some of the work rules that now are burdening this company. For example, Ho-Ho's and Wonder Bread cannot be delivered on the same truck. Two trucks have to go to the supermarket, one to deliver the Ho-Ho's and the Twinkies, and one to deliver Wonder Bread. That can't work in a marketplace where competition's increasing, costs are increasing, and efficiency is being That's, demanded. Uh, so now you're hitting on a larger theme, which I wanted to move to. Um, so let's talk about private sector unions in general for a moment. I want to put up a chart for our viewers. I want to show you private sector union membership over the past 80 years or so. That dates back to 1929. What you can see is um, in the 1930s and 40s, right after World War II, union members private sector union membership was at its all-time high it approached 40 percent of, of total employment but look where we are now we're down below seven percent union membership in the private <clears throat> sector that's lower than when the Wagner Act was passed in 1930 which required it first of all gave uh, uh, employees the right to unionize and required employers to negotiate with unions um, mark why are we seeing such a decline in union membership across all businesses well, Will, I think the reason is, is pointed out in your introduction there. The fact is, is that unions now rely on government for their power. And the fact is they're not providing services to workers anymore. They're trying very hard, but it's very difficult when you spend half your time and half your money playing in politics because you're trying to protect your privilege. You know, workers in America are getting paychecks. They're getting benefits. They're getting a, a relationship with their employer that basically is, is important to each because if they don't work, then nobody makes any money. And if an employer treats an employee poorly, then they're not going to make any money either. So this idea of confrontation in labor policy is something that's antiquated. It did come out of the 1930s. Those were the halcyon days for unions. But now they actually have to sell a product to workers and yeah. they're not very good at yeah, it. Yeah, it's competition. Uh, so, so you guys, Buck, um, I, I saw a statistic mm. where um, union members make, on average, I think 19% more than, than non-union private sector employees. But that, that essentially, that benefit of making more money by being a union member was something that existed in the 70s and prior as competition has found itself into the marketplace. Whether or not you're talking about competing with Little Debbie's or whatever it may be, um, it's basically made every business have much stricter um, employment arrangements and, and, and taken away the, the, the ability for employees to negotiate for much higher things through union membership. Yeah, we also saw this in the GM restructuring. I mean, they actually made sure that e even though it went through a sort of bankruptcy with, of course, a lot of government giveaways to them um, and, and decided that the bondholders no longer, their contracts were null and void, um, they made sure that, for example, when they rehire people back, they have to hire people that lost their jobs as part of that initial restructuring. Right. So you're, and, you, and you have to hire them back at their initial <clears throat> wage. So what you see is the unions continuing to try to sort of hold on to the glory of the past, which I think is what you're, what you're referring right. to here. But I also see this, and, and Matt, I, this is where I was immediately thinking about you, because this is just a little too late for us, unfortunately, after the election, because what we see here is the reality of what it means to have a company where they don't restructure properly. You see that, for example, a union can just crater it. These people who are sending out there saying, we're not going back in, we're done. Mitt Romney, vulture capitalism, all of that stuff. The private equity firm that actually was involved in this wasn't successful. They're not going to make out on this at all. They were trying to prevent 18,000 people from losing their jobs and everybody winning out. Maybe some people would have lost their jobs. But the story that we were told about private equity in cases like this is that it's never the union's fault. It's guys like Mitt Romney who come in and just destroy everything. Well, those 18,000 people lost their jobs because somebody like Mitt Romney wasn't able to turn it around. Yeah.